Hey chemists, you did it. We're at the last lesson for this unit. So we're going to talk now a little bit about Dalton's law and Graham's law, and then talk about real versus ideal gas behavior. So after today, you should be able to describe Dalton's law of partial pressures, calculate P total or a partial pressure, explain Graham's law of effusion and calculate the rate at which gas is effused, and explain what is meant by the term real versus an ideal gas. Recall that gas pressure results from collisions of gas particles. Gas pressure depends on the amount of gas and the kinetic energy of the particles. Since particles in a mixture of gases at the same temperature contain the same average kinetic energy, the kind of particle is really unimportant at this point. So here's an example. Look at dry air. Air has a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and some other small traces of miscellaneous gases. If you notice, you've got the percentages, and then you can see that for the partial pressures, notice that the partial pressures all add up to 101.3 kPa, which is the pressure right at sea level. So taking this into account, we can now develop partial pressures. And so this is John Dalton, and he basically said that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the individual or partial pressures. So we just have to add here. So we're going to kind of simplify this by making a formula. So we say that the total pressure of like the mixture of gases is going to equal to the partial pressures of gas one, the partial pressure of gas two, and the partial pressure of gas three. So the sum of all of those will equal the total pressure, just like you saw for the composition of air. So the units of pressure, though, as we've discussed earlier with all our, our calculations, is you have to have the pressure units match or else you're not going to end up with the correct result. So here's an example. It says, what's the total pressure for a mixture of O2 and CO2 if the partial pressure of O2 is that and the partial pressure of CO2 is that? So just like I always do, I like to list out everything we have. And you can see that the pressure units do not match. So you are going to have to convert one into the other. It's really up to you which one you decide. Um, it doesn't matter. I always tend to do the first one. So I'm going to convert it into um, MMHG to make sure that those units match. And now it matches. So now if we want to solve for the total pressure, all we have to do are, is add those two values together. And so when you do that, you get 969 millimeters of mercury. So that's a really simple example. Just like I said, be on the lookout to make sure those pressure units match. Let's talk about Thomas Graham. So in 1846, Thomas Graham started talking about something called effusion. So you may be familiar already with diffusion. So diffusion is the tendency of gas particles to spontaneously spread out until uniformly distributed. But effusion is the escape of a gas through a teeny tiny pinhole in the container of gas. Gases with lower ma molar masses tend to effuse more quickly, right? Because they can move more quickly. So if we were to talk about Graham's law, Graham talks about the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of the gas's molar mass. So to examine this, this is Graham's law. Now don't freak out. I know this looks kind of scary, but remember we're talking inverse. So we've got the rate of gas A on the top over the rate of gas B on the bottom. And then we said it's inverse. So we've got the square root of the molar mass of B over the square root of the molar mass of A. So that's why it's inverse there. You could alternatively draw a one, like one large square root sign over the the whole fraction, but this is the easiest way that I wanted to show it in the PowerPoint presentation. So for us, um, if you went on to study chemistry elsewhere, you'd learn about other applications of this, but for our purposes, we want to keep it a little simple. So we're going to say always place the larger molar mass in the numerator. And here's why, because the question is going to ask which one effuses faster and then calculate how much faster. So to do this, we're going to start with the rate of H2 over the rate of Cl2. And the reason why I put rate of H2 on top is because that means in to the right of the equal sign, the molar mass of H2 is going to be on the bottom, which is what we want, because again, we want to put the higher molar mass in the numerator. So 
So this is the way it's going to look. So notice you're comparing the rate of H2 to the rate of Cl2. So um, notice too that I also had to double the molar masses because these are both diatomic. And so when you take the square root of each of these and then divide them, you get 5.92 times. Well, what does that mean? Basically just means that H2 is going to effuse 5.92 times faster than Cl2. Okay, and so that's how you do Graham's Law. And like I said, because you're calculating how much faster, always put the larger molar mass on top. That'll make your life a lot easier. So the last section talks about real versus ideal gases. So the gas laws we've learned about in this unit are all based on the idea that these gases are behaving ideally which basically means that we are making our assumptions that there's no molecular volume for our gases and that there's no attractive forces for our gases. Now, in reality though, there are no perfectly ideal gases, but under most conditions, our real gases will approximate ideal gas behavior. However, there are certain conditions though that we'll, we'll see that real gases will deviate from ideal gas behavior or not behave similar to an ideal gas. So let's talk about these conditions. So these deviations where we'll see our real gases kind of deviate from ideal behavior is if you have a high pressure. So with a high pressure system, usually you'll see that gas particles are pushed closer together. So when these particles are pushed closer together, remember the spacing between particles will help to determine the attractive forces that result. So if they're closer together, there's more attractive forces. The second condition is if you have a low temperature, right? From what you know about gases, you know that if you were to decrease the temperature of a gas, you're gonna see the gas start to kinda compress. And if the gas is compressing, again, those particle spacings are gonna be smaller, so therefore you're gonna have greater attractive forces. If you have a high molar mass, so let's say you've got a big gaseous molecule of some kind, usually a high molar mass goes against the fact that we assume that there's no molecular volume for our gases. So that means that we'll have a larger molecular volume as a result. And then finally, if you have a pretty polar molecule, gaseous molecule, remember you've got an unequal sharing of electrons. So you've got a partial positive end of the molecule and a partial negative end of the molecule. And if that's the case, you're going to see a stronger attraction between molecules as a result. So again, these are the four conditions that we see where our real gases tend to deviate from ideal behavior. Well, you made it, guys. Thank you so much for watching the videos in this series. I hope it was really helping you to understand a lot of the relationships with gases now you've got one last worksheet, one last thing to work on to practice your knowledge and skills. Thank you so much for watching.